Kyle Larson gets at least some Indy 500 redemption in today's controversy-filled Brickyard 400. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove Brickyard 400 Edition. Pocono was nice, wasn't it? We had Nashville, five overtimes. Chicago, rainy, shortened by darkness. Pocono, finally a straightforward NASCAR Cup Series event. Indianapolis today, right back into the chaos. The madness that is the NASCAR Cup Series. So much to get to. Double overtime? Guys running out of fuel? Restart controversy? Blend line controversies? We're making up controversies over here. I don't even know where to start. We will talk about the playoffs. The playoff picture looks extremely different. We'll put this race on the groovy gauge at the end, but let, let's just start with the finish. But which finish? Kyle Larson gets the win. I'll start with him. Fourth win of the season. He is now the winningest NASCAR Cup Series driver this year. And some redemption, perhaps, for a disappointing Memorial Day weekend. Remember, Kyle Larson attempted the Indy 500 Coke 600 double. Rain at Indianapolis delayed the start. He chose to run that race, did pretty well until a late race speeding penalty derailed potentially a top 10 or top 5 run. He obviously then missed the Coca-Cola 600. Very disappointing weekend. They brought back the same uh, NASCAR paint scheme with some of that Aero McLaren orange. Kind of a fun callback. Good looking paint scheme. And thanks in part to strategy, timely cautions, perhaps some timely no calls as well, some gamesmanship maybe on the second to last restart. We'll get to that, I promise. But big picture, Kyle Larson, Cliff Daniels, they continue to set themselves apart. Four wins on the season. Kyle Larson retakes the regular season points lead. We'll look at that in a moment. And another crown jewel to put in Kyle Larson's trophy case. So congratulations to the whole number five team. But now let's discuss how he got it done. In the close Closing laps of regulation, we had a very compelling fuel mileage race shaping up. Brad Keselowski somehow managed to save over 60 laps, leading Red Hot Ryan Blaney running second with a little more fuel to play with, and in a close third, the hard-charging Kyle Larson with plenty of fuel, good to go. 10 laps to go, then 5, then 4, then 3. Can Brad Keselowski somehow save enough fuel? Can Ryan Blaney hold off the 5? Really intense stuff, had me on the edge of my seat. And then Kyle Busch bins it with three to go. Ugh. Quick tangent, if you will. Kyle Busch had a really good run going. He was running sixth in the closing laps, was looking to take fifth from Denny Hamlin. Hamlin puts an aggressive block on him, but then Kyle Busch slides up in the center of the corner and backs it into the wall. If you ask me, and maybe this is a hot take, that was one of the most inexplicable moves I've ever seen from Kyle Busch. He has had a terrible season. It's been well documented. What's the difference between fifth and sixth? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Sure, Denny Hamlin threw a really big block. Kyle Busch threw a really big block on Corey LaJoy last week, too. He knows how this game is played. You cannot crash your car right there. Not with less than three laps to go when you're finally having a respectable day. Now you've wrecked another piece of equipment. Your overworked crew members at the shop now have even more on their plate. Morale continues to spiral downwards. Inexplicable. A borderline inexcusable mistake from the future Hall of Famer, two-time Cup Series champion. Like, we give RCR a ton of crap because they are not bringing consistently good cars to the racetrack, but Kyle Busch right there, the latest example of him overdriving it, not using his head, really bad mistake with three to go. Tangent over, that set up overtime. Brad Keselowski, he's already got a win this year, nothing to lose, just chasing more playoff points. They leave him out there, coming to the green, coming to the restart zone. The six feels a bobble. He pulls off down to pit road, allowing the entire inside lane to move up. This all happens quickly, just a few seconds away from the restart zone. I don't think Larson and Blaney on the front row truly knew the rules. Per the rules, Blaney, despite initially being second place before Keselowski pulled off, is now the control car. He's still in that outside lane that he chose before, but he is supposed to fire first. Larson, despite filling Keselowski's spot, is not the race leader. He must let Blaney hit the restart zone and hit the gas first. If you ask me, and it's kind of hard to tell without seeing SMT, without seeing real-time telemetry, but it looks like Larson goes first. The inside lane was preferred on restarts all day long, so Larson, with that good jump, easily took the lead, and Blaney, justifiably so, was furious. Look, I think Larson went a little early, 
per the rulebook, he probably should have been called for a restart violation, but that is a very tough call to make. And we've seen NASCAR sit on their hands, late race restarts. They wouldn't call Hamlin jumping the restart at Richmond earlier this year. Even though if you ask me, that one was a little more obvious. I mean, Hamlin was the control car in that case, but he went a good few feet before the restart zone, clearly. By the letter of the law, I think Larson jumped that restart, but man, that's such a tough call to make because in that moment, again, I'm not sure Blaney or Larson truly knew the rule because they had a matter of seconds to react to the race leader Brad Keselowski peeling off the track. That's just a really tough spot for everyone. Blaney's anger and frustration on the radio afterwards was totally justified in my opinion, but to me, I'm just going to chalk it up to a very unlucky situation. Sometimes that happens. I do feel bad for Ryan Blaney there. I truly wish Blaney and Larson and Keselowski could have raced things out under green before the Kyle Busch crash. I wish we didn't have overtime. The race was so compelling before overtime. Then we had to sit through a second overtime, a red flag, because shortly after this you know, Larson Blaney controversial restart, a big crash breaks out. By big, I mean huge crash. John Hernemchek makes a block, slams the inside wall, actually destroys part of the wall, slides back up in front of traffic. Danny Hamlin, who had a good car today, of course, piles in. Bowman as well. Tough break for a lot of those guys. Big hits for a lot of those guys. Again, this led to a red flag to repair the inside wall. Finally, we re-racked him for overtime number two. And more controversy ensued. Now Larson, the control car, picked the inside lane, went when he was supposed to, and easily took the lead. Blaney actually slipped to third. Tyler Reddick, who also was on the same strategy as Larson, took second. But then going down the back straightaway mid-pack, Ryan Priest gets spun. He taps the inside wall, comes to a halt. The field moves on. No one is coming. There's no oncoming traffic. NASCAR, as they've done many times in the past, held on to the yellow hoping that Priest could get it rolling before the leaders came back around. Indianapolis is a big track. He had time to hopefully get it fixed. But where this becomes controversial is, I think by the time the field was in turn four, you know, coming around turn four, nearing the white flag, it was pretty clear Priest wasn't going anywhere. He had tires down. We know this car gets beached easily. NASCAR had probably five, six, seven, eight seconds to throw the caution, and we would have re-racked them for a third overtime. They had that choice. NASCAR chose not to. Maybe they didn't have as good a vantage point as we did on TV. Maybe they thought there was still a chance Priest was going to get it rolling. He, he did roll for a minute before eventually stalling with the flat tires. Maybe they thought he'd get back going. Eventually, NASCAR had to throw the caution for safety reasons, but by that point, the field had seen the white. The race was over. Kyle Larson cruised around for the victory. Fans were furious. I wasn't, and I know a lot of y'all disagreed with my take on Twitter, and again, by the law of the land, when Priest went spinning and, you know, tapped the inside wall, that should have probably been a caution instantly. But we've seen NASCAR many, many times in the past swallow the whistle in that kind of situation. When there's no incoming traffic, they'll wait for a really long time to see if someone can get it going. They do this all the time. I didn't have a problem with them doing that in this case. I didn't want to sit through another five pace laps, wait for another restart that could potentially screw a bunch of the top five guys out of finishes I felt they'd earned. I didn't want to see that. NASCAR clearly didn't want to see that, so they did what they've done many times in the past. They waited and waited and waited, and maybe they waited too long. Perhaps they should have thrown the caution and we should have had a third overtime. Per the law of the land, that's probably what should have been done. NASCAR chose not to and fans were furious. I get it. If you bought a ticket, you want to see the finish end under green. For me at home, I was kind of over with it. I felt like Larson, Blaney, Reddick had already settled the race between themselves. The lead was decided and the race had already been moved from NBC to cable. Before that final red flag, yeah, NBC broadcast had to cut to... I don't know, my local affiliate was showing a nature documentary. They had to cut to something, I guess. Apparently big news in the US today. So the finish of the Brickyard 400 got moved last second to cable screwing millions of fans watching at home out of an opportunity to see the finish. So my point was sitting at home, I was over this race. I felt that I'd seen the finish. I didn't want to see a mid-pack spin and flat tire lead to another restart, potentially more leaders running out of gas. I didn't want to see Nashville all over again. You guys know how I felt about Nashville. A lot of y'all disagreed with my take. I did not like seeing five overtimes decide the Ally 400. I've been consistent on this. It's a personal preference. If you wanted to see a third overtime, sure thing. I was fine with the race finishing when it did. I felt like the lead had been decided. Another NASCAR Cup Series race in the books, another handful of controversies we get to dissect here on the show. Isn't it so much fun? <sighs> anyway, 
quite the return for the Brickyard 400. We'll put this race on the groovy gauge at the end. For now, a look at the top finishers. Another victory for Kyle Larson. Tyler Reddick with another top five finish. Honestly, if you ask me, these top four could easily be the four drivers at Phoenix racing for a championship. Tyler Reddick continues to impress. Ryan Blaney continues his red hot summer. Christopher Bell with a sneaky fourth place finish. Good for him. Bubba Wallace finishes fifth. Huge points day for Bubba. We go back two weeks ago. Go back to, what was it? Uh, Chicago was two weeks ago. Pre-Chicago, Bubba Wallace was 51 points outside of the playoffs. Now, as you'll see in a moment, he's cut that down to single digits. And remember, at New Hampshire, he was running top 10 when he got spun by Noah Gregson. At Chicago, he was top 10 when he got spun by eventual race winner Alex Bowman. So he's left points on the table and is still reined in that bubble quickly. Well done, Bubba Wallace. Great performance, great strategy, great perseverance today. Some other fun names in the top 10 here, Todd Gilland, Austin Sindrick, Daniel Suarez. Ninth for Noah Gregson, I believe he also earned a stage point or two today, good result for him. And Chase Elliott finishes 10th. Another controversy, early on, Elliott running inside the top five gets called for a blend line violation in stage one during green flag pit stops. According to NASCAR, Chase Elliott moved all four of his tires up onto the racing surface beyond the acceleration lane between turn one and two sooner than he was supposed to, hence the pass-through penalty which cost him a ton of track position early. There was some confusion over the radio. See, the official excerpt from the rulebook that folks shared on social media reads that drivers must use the warm-up lane until the exit of turn two. With Elliott moving all four tires up above the warm-up lane, a penalty was justified. But Chase Elliott, as well as Brad Keselowski, who got dinged for the same penalty in the same stage, referenced an email that NASCAR apparently sent out. And this email reads, quote, you may swing wide beyond the white line on the acceleration lane between turns one and two, stay off the racing surface. So you may swing wide beyond the acceleration line. I need like a diagram because there's a lot of lines as you can see in this picture. They say stay off the racing surface, which to me would imply stay below all the white lines, but some may equate the racing surface with the racing groove or the racing line. And Elliot Keselowski were both still way below the racing line. I understand some confusion. Ultimately, it's on Chase Elliott and Brad Keselowski to know the correct rules. They were the only two, I believe, all day to get dinged for such a violation. So ultimately, it's on them to fully understand the rules. But I get it. The rule is written a little strangely, and it's written differently in two different places. It means roughly the same thing, but why use different wording, somewhat vague terminology? Why not just say, hey, don't go above that third white line. Don't cross it. You cross it before the exit of turn two, that's a penalty. Why not just make it simple, black and white? Why even say that you can swing wide of one line? Just pick a line on the track and say, don't cross this. You cross this line too early, you're done. You're kaput. Why not make it simple? That's all I ask. Why do we have the same rule worded two different ways in two different places? That's confusing. That is on NASCAR. Drivers should know better, but I at least partially understand some confusion early on. Uh, either way, nice to see Chase Elliott recover, more or less, to finish inside the top 10. Good result. Look at the rest of the top 15 right there. Stenhouse, Hosevar, Corey LaJoy gets a top 15. Ross Chastain squeaks out a top 15. Let's look at the playoff standings. The regular season standings are way off to the side. Playoff points on the line there. But all around me is the playoff grid as things currently stand. And now Ross Chastain is 16th only seven points to the good. He lost 20 points to Bubba Wallace today. Bubba won a stage, his first stage win in almost two years. Chastain failed to earn a single stage point. And besides just Chastain, even Chris Buescher now is only 17 points to the good. Ty Gibbs has seen his huge points cushion get cut nearly in half the past couple of weeks. Back-to-back -back weeks with engine issues for Ty Gibbs. This is a problem. Every single week, Joe Gibbs Racing is having engine troubles. Sometimes it's Xfinity. They had some issues this weekend. Other times it's Cup. Back-to-back -back weeks at high speed, high horsepower, shifting tracks, Ty Gibbs has run into trouble. I don't know what the official diagnosis today was, but Ty Gibbs wound up 23rd. You can't keep making these mistakes if you hope to, one, make the playoffs. Forget about advancing to the round of 12 or the round of 8. A blown engine? Just one? can ruin your whole season in the fall. Toyota has a problem. They've got two weeks off now to try and figure things out. Something to watch these final few regular season races. 
Lots of other incidents in this race. Uh, Larson got into Truex at one point just after a restart. Truex didn't seem quick to blame Larson, though if you ask me, it looked like the five just slipped and collected the 19. Maybe Truex knew he was crowding him. I'm not sure, but then Truex wrecked again later on. Lots of damage. Bad day for MTJ. Another late race wreck on a restart. Josevar throws his car into the middle of three wide. Bunch of contact. Logano, Johnson get hooked into the fence. Tough break for Jimmy Johnson. I saw him making some passes out there today. I don't think he had you know better than a 25th place car, but with strategy and track position, could have maybe got a top 15, which would have been awesome. Did not happen, unfortunately. There was also the William Byron crash where he sort of got chopped by Chase Briscoe and then Priest trying to stick his nose into somewhere that didn't belong, hooked Harrison into Byron, big crash. So um, some spectacle out there at Indianapolis, of course. Again, one of these crashes destroyed the inside wall and resulted in a red flag for repairs. Glad to see all drivers walk away from these incidents. Before we get out of here today, let's put this race on the groovy gauge. The groovy gauge is powered by electric e-bikes all year long. Head to electric e-bikes. Link is in the description below to learn more. I am glad the Brickyard 400 is back. The crowd looked decent. Of course, IMS seats a quarter million people. So even with, I think they estimated 70, 80,000 fans today, that's a great crowd by any measure. It's going to look a little sparse in parts at a massive venue like Indianapolis. The drivers obviously care more about this race than they did the road course. So I'm happy to see it back. Was the racing great? No, it was extremely hard to pass one groove. I saw someone said this on social media. Basically, Indianapolis is Pocono, but it's just the tunnel turn. You know, the turn that infamously you couldn't go too wide through for many, many years. Yeah, that's basically all Indianapolis is all day long. The outside lane was never competitive. The draft wasn't as strong as we saw in the Xfinity race yesterday where they choked the horsepower significantly. It wasn't a bad race today because of the many different strategies and madness on the restarts, but when they got strung out single file over a long green flag run, it was very hard to pass, especially up front, especially when the leader was in remotely clean air. So still work to be done. A lot of this is just an Indianapolis problem. Some of it is the next gen. This car does not perform well at one groove tracks, and Indy basically is a one groove track. Still, if I'm going to give today's race a score, all of the controversy late is going to drag this score down a bit. I truly wish we could have finished this race under green. Why? Why, Kyle Busch? Just take the sixth. I'm going to give this race, gosh, the groovy gauge has been a headache, quite honestly, the last few weeks. I'm going to go 50, 50 percent, right down the middle. Happy that the Brickyard 400 is back. That's great. That's more prestigious. But between the blend line controversy, this race being moved onto cable, back to network, Back to cable, the restart violation that wasn't called, the controversial no call on the caution on the last lap. I mean, ugh, just too many other storylines taking away from the competition on the racetrack. I, I'm just going to go 50. Honestly, I'm starting to talk myself into a lower score. I'll leave it at 50 for now. Let me know in the comments below if you agree or disagree. I understand tensions, emotions are running high after this race, and that's fun. That's good. I'd rather we be more emotional about the actual on-track product and results rather than calls, officials, and controversy, but hey, whatever it is. Let me know how you're feeling after today's Brickyard 400, the 30th anniversary of the first Brickyard 400 back in 1994. That is going to do it for today's episode, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more NASCAR content every single day, every single week. Even with the Olympic break coming up, we'll still be here talking NASCAR all the time. Big thank you to my Patreon supporters as well. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, folks. I appreciate you tuning in. I will talk to y'all again soon.